office, and I still was missing it. And then the Holy Spirit just dropped a thought in my heart that the Christmas story did not begin in the New Testament. The Christmas story began in the Old Testament. In fact, it began in the book of beginnings. The Christmas story began in the book of Genesis. And as I began to go through the Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming of Messiah, I tell you, I had a visitation of the Holy Spirit that I had not experienced in a long, long time. And my laptop went one way and my Bible went the other way. And I jumped up and in the middle of the floor in my living room and I danced, I shouted, I jumped. I had me a hallelujah ho down, just me and Jesus. And the next night when I sat down to study, it was the same thing, the same anointing and revelation dropped in my spirit. And out of those two nights of study, this series was birthed. Now, when I am going to teach on a subject, I study it like I have never taught on it before. So this year, as I began to study, I studied it like I had never taught on it before, and I learned something. As many times in almost 29 years of teaching the Word, I learned something about the birth of Messiah. And I'm going to be sharing it next week. And I pray that you'll get to come to the whole series. Not that I'm anything. I am nothing. He is everything. And his word is wonderful. So I want you to open to the book of beginnings. Genesis chapter 3. The Christmas story began 4,000 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The first prophetic word concerning the coming Savior occurred in Genesis. It occurred in the Garden of Eden. The fall of man had just occurred. God was passing judgment upon Adam, Eve, and the serpent. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. What did he say? Thou art cursed. Look at verse 15. God says, serpent, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. God spoke this first prophetic word that the seed is coming. And the, he said to the serpent, you will bruise his heel, but he is going to bruise your head. God said to the serpent, the seed is coming. And the devil spent 4,000 years with those words hanging over his head. From the moment they were first spoken in the Garden of Eden, the enemy lived in fear of their fulfillment. God said to the serpent, the seed is coming. And when the enemy heard that the seed was coming, he immediately began to look for the seed so that he could destroy him. Over and over throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament, the enemy tried to stop the seed from coming. Adam and Eve, you remember, had two sons, Cain and Abel. God accepted Abel's sacrifice. But he rejected Cain's. So Satan thought, oh, this could be the seed. I'm going to make Cain angry enough to kill his brother. So Cain slew his brother Abel. Satan was trying to stop the seed. All through the Old Testament, the enemy continually tried to stop the seed. You remember in Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 21, Pharaoh had all of the male babies killed. He commanded them to be thrown into the river. Satan didn't know who the seed was. So he wanted all of the babies to be killed to be sure 
that he killed the seed. And all of the male babies were killed except Moses. And once again, the seed was preserved. Moses became the deliverer for the children of Israel. Moses is a type and shadow, a picture of Jesus, the deliverer who came 1,500 years after Moses. And you remember in the book of Esther, evil, wicked Haman influenced the king to give the command to, that all of the Jews would be killed. The enemy was trying to stop the seed. But Esther became the deliverer for her people, and she saved the seed. Finally, on one starlit night, the angelic announcement came. It finally was made. This angelic announcement that sent shockwaves through hell, and it rocked all of heaven. This announcement was made for unto you, is born this day a savior. And immediately the enemy, Satan, sprang into action trying to kill the seed because he knew then who the seed was. He did everything he could to stop this serpent crushing Messiah because God had spoke that that seed was going to crush his head. So once again, the enemy tried to destroy the seed. When Jesus was born, Herod had all of the male babies killed, two years old and younger, because Satan was trying to stop the seed. But nothing can stop the seed. Hallelujah. Jesus is the seed. Jesus, the seed, came. Jesus the seed was planted in the womb of a, a virgin named Mary when she was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. The seed lived, then the seed died. Oh, but then the seed arose. Hallelujah. Now the seed lives and the seed reigns forever and forevermore. Why? Because nothing can stop the seed. The whole entire Bible is the story of the seed. From Genesis to Malachi, the seed comes, Genesis 3.15. In the four Gospels, the seed dies, John 12.24. In the book of Acts, the seed lives, Acts 2.24. From Romans to Jude, the seed speaks Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And in the book of Revelation, the seed reigns. Revelation eleven fifteen. Hallelujah. The whole Bible is the story of the seed. Now, let's go ahead in time from the book of beginnings, from Genesis, which occurred 4,000 years before the birth of Christ, let's go ahead. Let's go forward in time to 700 years before the birth of Messiah. And let's look at another prophetic announcement about the seed coming. In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, the word of God says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. The name Emmanuel in Hebrew means God with us. Matthew quoted the prophet Isaiah's words in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And when Jesus was born, God was indeed with his people. When Jesus was born, God became man. John says it best in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Hallelujah. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, 
And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hallelujah. Jesus, the seed, Jesus, the Word, was made flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. The prophet Isaiah looked ahead 700 years down through the corridors of time, and he said, the seed is coming, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. Later, the prophet Isaiah again looked ahead in time, and he prophesied about the seed come In Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7, look at it. Isaiah writes, and he says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Think about it. As the prophet Isaiah looked 700 years into the future, his eyes were fixed in a steady gaze as he watched the screen of time unfold before his eyes. All his attention was riveted to this glorious scene that he was seeing unfolding before his eyes. Tell us, prophet man, what did you see? The prophet saw pictures on this screen of time. He saw pictures of battles, of wars, and darkness in the world filled with sin. But suddenly, the scene that he was watching began to change, and light began to shine out of the darkness. And the light shining through the darkness is coming from a little town called Bethlehem. And Isaiah watches on the screen of time. The scene is dark, but the sun begins to shine in the midst of the thick darkness. He sees the sun of righteousness rise with healing in his wings. Malachi 4.2 says, the light of the world has come. The seed has come. The deliverer has come. Isaiah is seeing this scene. Then Isaiah spoke as though what he was seeing had already come to pass. Look at it. Look at verse 6. He wrote as if the deliverer had already come. He penned the words, for unto us a child is born. Look at it. Unto us a son is born given present tense isaiah it was so real to the prophet man as he saw it unfold on the screen of time it, to him it was so real it was as if it had already happened then isaiah pressed the fast forward button on his spiritual vcr and he watched the scene as the next scenes unfolded in the life of christ he watched on that screen of time as the child became a man he watched as seed, this man performed miracles. And he watched this man walk into his destiny and fulfill the purpose of why he came. Tell us, prophet man, what did you see? He looked and then the prophet penned the names that describe the nature of this man. Why? Because one name can't explain him and the world cannot contain him. Hallelujah. The prophet wrote, the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, underline Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. What do these titles mean? Well, let's briefly look at each title and examine each one of them and see what they mean. The prophet Isaiah writes, the government 
shall be upon his shoulder. In Bible days, the king of any nation and all those that ruled and reigned in positions of authority wore royal purple robes. And the ensign, the sign, the symbol, the insignia, the banner, whatever you choose to call it, the ensign of that government was born upon their shoulder on that royal purple robe. It was attached. It could be embroidered. It could be pinned on the king's shoulder or those in authority. Or it could be hung, suspended from the shoulder. It could be an ensign a sept of a scepter, of a sword, or keys, etc., all through the Bible we can see this. But if you don't know the customs and manners of the Old Covenant, you miss it. Isaiah wrote about this clearly in Isaiah chapter 22, verses 21 through 22. Look at your handout. The prophet Isaiah writes, I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Look at verse 22. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. So he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. Had you ever read that before and wondered what that meant? This is not only speaking in the natural of an earthly man named Eliakim. But Isaiah is speaking prophetically. Of the king of kings. He's speaking of Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Because Jesus spoke of himself. Using these same words of the prophet Isaiah. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. These things saith he that is holy. He that is true. And he that hath the what? Key of David. He that openeth. And no man shutteth. And shutteth, and no man openeth. Hallelujah. Jesus has the keys. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. Jesus says, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Hallelujah. Jesus has the keys. Hallelujah. Jesus said to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus said, I will give unto thee, unto you, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The keys of the kingdom. Now let's look at the word shoulder in Isaiah chapter 22. Verse 22, the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder. This word shoulder in Hebrew is number 7926. If you look it up in the original Hebrew, if you look it up in a lexicon or a Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew word is shakim, and it means the neck between the shoulders as the place of burdens right here. Right here. In Bible days, remember what I said? The kings and all those who ruled in authority wore royal purple robes. And they wore ensigns. They wore the symbol of their kingdom on their shoulder. It could be embroidered on that royal purple robe. It could be hanging with a cloth. It could be pinned but it would be suspended on the shoulder of that king and those in authority. And I submit to you that the Savior's ensign, which he bore upon his shoulder, was the cross. That he carried upon his shoulder on the way to Golgotha. Think about it. Isaiah the prophet man saw the screen of time. And he watched the, the scene at Calvary unfold before his eyes 
He, he saw the Savior being beaten. He saw the soldiers place a purple robe upon his shoulders. And he saw the, show, the soldiers mock him as they bowed the knee and said, Hail, King of the Jews, in mockery. And Isaiah watched as the scene changed. And then he saw Jesus carrying the cross, bearing that ensign upon his shoulders. And the scene changed, and Isaiah saw Jesus hanging on the cross. And Isaiah pinned the scene that he saw in Isaiah chapter 52 and chapter 53. Tell us, prophet man, what did you see? His visage was marred more than any man, Isaiah 52, 14. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, Isaiah 53, 4. The Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all, Isaiah chapter 53, 6. Tell us, prophet man, what else did you see? Not only will the government be upon his shoulder, but his name shall be called wonderful. This word wonderful in Hebrew is number 6382 and it means miracle. It means a wonder. It means a marvelous thing. And isn't Jesus wonderful? All the things that he said and did were wonderful. His love for mankind was wonderful in that he was willing to die for all. His virgin birth was a miracle and a wonder. All the miracles that he performed while on earth were wonderful. They were a, a sign and a wonder. His death, burial, resurrection and ascension were all a wonder. What else did you see, prophet man? Not only will the government be upon his shoulder, not only will his name be called wonderful, he shall be called counselor. This word counselor in the Hebrew is number 3289. And the Barnes notes says that the meaning denotes one of honorable rank, one who is suited to stand near princes and kings as their advisor. It is expressive of great wisdom. Doesn't that describe Jesus? Jesus, it is he alone that has the words of life. He is the counselor like none other, for he knows all things, not only Will the government be upon his shoulder? Not only will his name be called Wonderful and Counselor. What else, prophet man? His name shall be called the Mighty God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Jesus is the champion of all champions. He's the victorious general who rides triumphantly through every battle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is the conquering king who conquered the enemy and he took the enemy's spoils. And we are the spoils that Jesus won in that battle with the forces of darkness. And Jesus, our mighty conqueror, parades us as trophies of his triumph. Just as Colossians 2.15 and 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Colossians 2.15 says, And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe or a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it or in him, in the victory he won over the enemy. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Hallelujah! Not only will the government be upon his shoulder, not only will his name be called Wonderful and Counselor, the Mighty God. What else, prophet man? His name shall be called the ever lasting father. This word everlasting is number 5703 and it means eternity. It means perpetually. It means world without end. Everlasting means eternity, perpetually, world without end. 
The literal translation is the Father of eternity. Jesus. The prophet Isaiah called Jesus the Father of eternity. He is the triumphant king who reigns throughout eternity forever and ever and ever. World without end. Amen. Not only will the government, government be upon his shoulder. Not only will his name be called Wonderful and Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. What else did you see, prophet man? His name shall be called the Prince of Peace. This word prince is number 8269 in the Hebrew. And it means the chief captain, the general, the ruler. Jesus is the chief captain of the army of hosts. He's the general, the victorious general. He's the ruler. That word peace, prince of peace. That word peace in Hebrew is number 7965 and it's shalom. Shalom. And it means help. It means security. It means tranquility. It means welfare, comfort, and peace. You mean shalom? That one Hebrew word, that one little word means all those words in our English language? Yes. Shalom in Hebrew means help, security, tranquility, welfare, comfort, and peace. Hallelujah. Jesus, the seed, is the captain. He's the general who rules over all things. And he is our help. He is our security. He is our tranquility. He is our welfare. He is our comfort. And oh, hallelujah, he is our peace. He's the prince of peace. He is the peaceful prince who came and restored peace to a world in turmoil and in sin. Now, let's go ahead in time and see another prophet who looked into the screen of time and he saw on that screen of time, he saw a panoramic view of the Messiah who was to come. Turn to the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. Micah... Chapter 5, verse 2. The prophet Micah sees on the screen of time and he begins to pen, he begins to write what he is seeing unfold before his eyes. In Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the prophet Micah writes, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee, Shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Sounds like he saw the same thing the prophet Isaiah saw, doesn't it? Tell us, Micah, you be the second witness. The prophet Isaiah was the first witness of the coming Messiah. Prophet Micah. You be that second witness and you tell us, prophet man, what did you see on that screen of time as you looked? He looked down through the corridors of time and, and he saw on that screen, he saw a town called Bethlehem Ephratah. The name Ephratah means fruitful, fruitful. Think about it. Jesus, the Messiah, the seed, was born in a land that means fruitful. And he sure lived up to that name, didn't he? Jesus is called the branch in Jeremiah thirty-three fifteen, And what a fruitful branch Jesus, the Messiah, is. And in this place, Bethlehem Ephrata. The prophet Micah saw a child being born who was to be ruler and king forever. The name Bethlehem means house of bread. 
Bethlehem. It's made up of two Hebrew words, bet, house, lechem, bread. Bethlehem means house of bread. Micah saw displayed on the screen of time the true bread coming from the house of bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of God, which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. John chapter 6 verse 33 says, and in John chapter 6 verse 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of of life. How fitting that the bread of life would be born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Just a coincidence? Just an accident? No way. God planned it from ages past that the seed would come and he had it planned to the most minute detail, and he fulfilled every word that his prophets had spoke down through the ages about this seed, the Messiah that would come. Oh, but the prophet man, Micah, he not only looked through the corridors of time, he also looked back in time to the beginning of time. And from what he saw, the prophet Micah penned these words, he writes, whose goings forth have been from of old. Whose goings forth, look at it, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, the very last part of the verse. Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. The prophet Micah went back in time approximately 3,300 years to the Garden of Eden. He went back in time on that panoramic view that he was watching on the screen of time. He went back to Genesis. He went back to the Garden of Eden. And he saw that God promised that a seed would come and deliver all of mankind. And at the fall of Adam, Micah saw that God promised a seed. For the seed existed before there was any time. Jesus, the Messiah, was before all things. He was the creator of all things. The one who was before time, created time, then stepped into time in Bethlehem's manger and then stepped back out of time and into eternity. Hallelujah! Where he rules and reigns on his throne forever and evermore. Micah chapter 5 and verse 3, look at it. The prophet Micah writes, Therefore will he give him up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. This verse has a twofold meaning. It's talking about natural Israel, the ten tribes being scattered throughout the earth, and how they will be brought back in. Then the remnant, Micah writes, of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Oh, but look at the phrase in this verse. She which travaileth hath brought forth. This is speaking prophetically about two events. The book of Revelation speaks of a woman which represents the church. And this woman will give birth to a man-child and this man-child is referring to a company of people, and we are this company of people. But this verse is also, also speaking prophetically about the Virgin Mary giving birth to Jesus the Messiah, the seed who would deliver the world from their sins. How do we know this? Look at the very next verse. In Micah chapter 5, verse 4, look at it. He shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. Look at the phrase, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord. Who's this speaking about? This is speaking in reference to a shepherd who feeds 
and who leads his flock. Who is the shepherd? Jesus is the shepherd, and we are his sheep. Jesus spoke of himself as being a shepherd, and Peter also spoke of Jesus as being a shepherd. Look at your handout, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 25. For you were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Jesus is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. The prophet Micah looked ahead down through the corridors of time and he saw that the shepherd would be born in Bethlehem. Jesus himself said in John chapter 10 verse 11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Jesus is our good shepherd. Jesus prayed and he said in John chapter 17 verse 12, Jesus said, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept and none of them is lost. Jesus said, Father, I have not lost one of those that you gave me. Jesus is the shepherd who left the ninety and the nine in the fold. And he went after that one that was lost. Aren't you glad that when you was that one that was lost, that the good shepherd came after you and found you and he didn't leave you lost. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 says, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of his everlasting covenant. Hallelujah. Don't get me started on the blood covenant again. Look at this verse. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. How? Through the price that he paid for us, his shed blood, entering into the blood covenant with us. Hallelujah. Jesus is not only the shepherd and bishop of our souls. He's not only the good shepherd. He's not only the great shepherd. Oh, but 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 4 says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, then shall ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Hallelujah. Look at these verses. Jesus is the shepherd and bishop of our souls. 1 Peter 2, 25. He's the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 11. He's the great shepherd. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20. And he's the chief shepherd. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. Jesus is the shepherd of all shepherds. Is it any wonder that the shepherds were the first ones to receive the news of the shepherd's Savior's birth. Hallelujah. The angels said to the shepherds, Shepherds, hey, come and see your shepherd. Come and see the shepherd of your soul. Come and see your shepherd. You may keep natural sheep, shepherds, but come here. I want you to go and see your shepherd. I want you to see the shepherd and bishop of your souls. I want you to see the good shepherd. I want you to see the great shepherd. I want you to see the chief shepherd. Shepherds, come and see your shepherd. And the shepherds came and they looked in that manger and they saw their shepherd. They saw the shepherd and bishop of their souls. They saw the good shepherd. They saw the great shepherd. They saw the chief shepherd. They saw the shepherd of all shepherds. They saw the shepherd king. They saw the king of kings. And the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. Give praise to your shepherd king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give praise to your shepherd king. Now I want to end by reading something. It was, part of it was originally written by a great prophet man of God, H. Richard Hall. 
And then as I read it and as I've studied over the years, I've added things to it and, and moved things around. But this is called, What Was in That Manger? When the shepherds went and when they looked at that seed, when they looked at that baby in that manger, what was in that manger? He was the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation for all time and eternity. He was the very first word in the Bible and the absolute last word. He was the peace of God and the hope of God. He was the creation of God. He had the nature of God and he was the faithfulness of God. He was the message of God and he was the messenger of God. He was the promise of God. What was in that manger? He was God's forgiveness and deliverer. He was the benevolence of God. He was the express image of God. He was the Lamb of God. He was the Word of God. He was the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. He was the power of God and the mercy of God. He was the author and the perfecter of our faith. Who was this Jesus in that manger? He was the captain of our salvation. He was the everlasting Father and the Lord of glory. He was the Son of God, the Son of Man, and the presence of God. He was the Lord of Lords, and He was the Lord of all. He was the King of Israel. He was our advocate with the Father and the mediator of eternity. What was in that manger? He was the ruler of the kings of this earth. He was the king of kings. He was the offspring and the branch of David. He was the first and the last, the future and the past. He was Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He was and is and always will be. What was in that manger? The Bible tells us that he was the Christ the Messiah. He was the Savior of mankind. He was the wonderful counselor and the faithful witness. He was the good shepherd and the great high priest. He was the rock of ages and a rock in a weary land. He was the water of life and he was the bread of life. What was in that manger? He was the way, the truth, and the life. He was the door to eternity. He was the resurrection and deity. He was all happiness all joy, all love, all peace, all power, and all life. He was all help and all hope. What was in that manger? He was every miracle, every sign, and every wonder. He was the message of the prophets, the song of the angels, the hope of the ages. He was the tree of life. He was the river of life. He was life. He was the cloud by day and the fire by night. He was life to the dead and healing to the sick. He was sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf. What was in that manger? He was help for the helpless and hope for the hopeless. He was the ripple of every stream and wave of every ocean. He was the breeze that flows through the trees. He was the red of all the roses and the green of all the grass. He was the blue of the beautiful sky and the harvest of every field. He was the beauty of the violet and the lily of the valley. He was the bright and morning star. What was in that manger? He was the sun of righteousness with healing in his wings. He was the creature, the creation, and the creator. He was the will of the Father fulfilled in the flesh. He was in eternity past and will be in eternity future. What was in that manger? He was the faith of Abraham and the faithfulness of Isaac. He was the ladder of Jacob and the provider for Joseph. He was the ark of Noah and the song of Moses. He was the high priest for Aaron and victory for Joshua. He was the love song of Ruth and the prophetic call of Samuel. He was the shepherd of David and the wisdom of Solomon. What was in that manger? He was the miracles of Elijah and the double portion of Elisha. He was the healer of Hezekiah and the builder for Nehemiah. 
He was the patience of Job and the prince of peace to Isaiah. He was the handwriting on the wall for Daniel. And he was the deliverer from the furnace of fire for the three Hebrew boys. What was in that manger? He was Shiloh. He was Star. He was Emmanuel. He was and is all things to all men. He was the atonement and the great redeemer. He was the eternal propitiation and the eternal sacrifice for all time and eternity. He was the eternal substitution. He was the ultimate and the conclusion. What was in that manger? He was the prophet the firstborn and the anointed one. He was the king of Salem and the, pre- and the priest of the most high God. He was the great high priest. He was the Passover and he was the Passover lamb. Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. I confess him for all time and eternity as the all in all. The firstborn of all creation. The great I am. My my Lord and my God, what more can I say of what was in that manger? Hallelujah! Give him praise. Give him Thank you. 